Welcome to Ignite Intimacy, a podcast exploring intimacy, romantic relationships, sexuality, and the all of everything that relates to these hot topics. We're going in. You ready? This is your host, Miss La. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. All right, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone else, it is Miss La, Laura Aisha. We're here, Ignite Intimacy. It is the day before Christmas Eve. You'll listen to this at some point in the future, and the winter solstice just happened. We're welcoming in the, the dark season, but you know, the dark always includes the light. So as we enter winter, the days will start to get longer. And I am really, really excited about today's guest. I've, I have not come across anyone like this woman and just really, really honored to have her on the line with us today. And so I have got someone very special for you. Uh, this is Dr. Jana Rangalova. And welcome. Welcome to Ignite Intimacy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. How's everything over there in Brooklyn? Uh, in New York, yeah, Not bad. <laughs> a little cold, but you know. Cool. Well, you're you're on your way to the heat, so that's true. I am on my way to Costa Rica for for the month, so oh. I'll be leaving the cold. Yes, I love that. January is the perfect time to leave New York. Yeah, and especially for professors who uh, you know don't teach in the winter. It mm-hmm. is the time to leave. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, so Jana and I were supposed to meet in person last week. My twin sister and my daughter and I do an annual holiday trip to New York City and we rage around the city and we eat and we ice skate and we mm-hmm. do all sorts of really fun, cool stuff and, and connect with people like Jana and, and other friends and, and family and, and just because of a number of different reasons my sister and I my daughter couldn't make it and we decided not to go so I was super bummed because I really wanted to meet (laughs) Jana in person and I know I have a feeling that will happen someday inshallah and but but you know for whatever reason it wasn't meant to happen last week so I so appreciate you being willing to reschedule with me and and at least for now we're doing this conversation virtually sure it's okay Cool. It's better than nothing. Exactly. Yeah. And it was great to see your, see your, your beautiful face this morning. And um, mm-hmm. I'm so curious about you. I'm like, um, so you have an accent. So, and your name is just like gorgeous. I just, I love that your last name has Lava in it. It's like, oh, yeah. Lava. like, and so the fact that you work in this space of, of sex and sexuality and is, is just so cool. And so where are you from? I'm from uh, Macedonia originally. It's a small country in Southeast Europe, which used to be part of a larger country when I was born called Yugoslavia. And then it broke into many different pieces, one of which is Macedonia. So uh, for those of you who are not aware of mm-hmm. <laughs> the existence of that country. <laughs> well, I have, yeah. yeah, I have a friend from uh, her family's from Macedonia. Okay. Yeah, and um, I she's a belly dancer, incredible, <laughs> incredible belly dancer, and she also does other styles of dance. She travels around the world, and currently she lives in Brazil. But but yeah, she goes back to Macedonia every year because there's this big festival, and mm. she's involved in the dancing of you know she works with the dancers and and right. all of that. I don't know what festival it is, but I'm sure there are many. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are. Yeah, I don't know them all. I've been out of there for so many years now that yeah, I've been here for 10 years. Wow. Okay. And so did you do all of your studies based primarily in New York? Or where did you start your, your journey no, into all of this? I did my uh, BA in Macedonia. Okay. In the capital. I yeah, I majored in psychology. And then after that, I came to the U.S. to do my Ph.D. at Cornell University, so upstate New York, not in New York City, which was probably a good idea because I don't know how anyone gets a Ph.D. <laughs> done in New York City with all the distractions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Cornell is in Ithaca, for those of you that don't know, and Ithaca is like this gorgeous, amazing little town nestled in a valley, I guess you could say, and, and it's right by, is it Cayuga Lake? 
Yes, Cayuga Lake, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really a sweet, sweet little spot, but there's not a lot going on there. Nope, <laughs> <laughs> not a lot going on. So it's a good place to do a PhD. So I did my PhD in developmental psychology, but I really specialized or, or focused on sexuality and sexual development and how sexuality is related to mental mental health and psychological thriving and well-being. Mm. And then about three years ago, once I was done with the PhD, I moved to New York and started teaching at NYU as an adjunct professor. So I'm, I teach undergrads on human sexuality, sexual orientation, and sometimes some, some other classes do. Mm. Yeah, well, I'd love to know about some of those other classes, but I'm so curious. This is such a specific area of study. And what I've learned recently is that a lot of psychologists and therapists don't have any training in the area of sex education, sexuality. That's true. So and it's very sad. What is up with that? I mean, it's such a huge <laughs> part of our human existence, right? I know. I know. And, you know, I, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a clinical or, or counseling psychologist. I don't I'm not a therapist of any kind. So I don't see uh, patients but or clients. But even those who do, they are very rarely trained specifically in sexuality. If they're lucky, their school had a human sexuality class. But many, many do not. And, you know, the, the reason why it's <laughs> it probably goes goes to the more general issue around, uh, you know, sex negativity and and kind of puritan values and not mm. wanting to, you know to talk about that not having people who in the department or in the various departments who will support that that aspect of of education and i don't know maybe some people don't think it's relevant so there are a lot of therapists of, of different kinds right there are a lot of different kinds of mental health mm. practitioners mm-hmm. social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists and many of them graduate without having had a lot of sex education uh, that extends to doctors right <laughs> you know medical doctors not not just psychologists and, mm-hmm. and they also need to know the some of the sexual aspects of of physical functioning and psychological functioning but yeah it's a it's an area that needs a lot of improvement mm. Mm, Absolutely. I mean, I just think of like, first of all, all the sexual trauma and the sexual abuse and, you know, like all of that, there's so much of that that's gone on in the world and that goes on in the world. And you would think that doctors and, you know, people who are dealing with mental health, Mm -hmm. because a lot of the world's problems probably stem from people being sexually abused when they were younger. Probably a, a, a fair amount of issues are related to that. But even beyond that, you know, very sort of traumatic experience, there's there's a lot that happens in people's lives that is related somehow to sexuality or relationships that is just not being addressed. Mm-hmm. And uh, all the repression that happens is, is probably as as problematic and as indicative of, of issues that people can have as some more traumatic experience like mm-hmm. sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's so subtle. But, exactly. And but, just accrues over over time, yeah. you know, it sits there and it adds more and more and more. And then you get to be, you know, 18, 20, 30, uh, and you realize, wait a second, there are all these issues that I've never addressed because I've never had the language to address them because no one ever had talked to me about that and so on. Mm. Mm. Well, and I just think of just all of the, like you said, Puritan values Mm -hmm. and, you know, somewhere way back in the day, centuries ago, you know, there was this shift in the approach to sex and sexuality and it became tied up with religion. And I think from my estimation, it's like trying to stifle that passion and that desire and that, you know, like sexual need to explore and experience. Mm -hmm. And, and from what I, what I can tell is just from that need to control that energy, it spawned all this, these like so much shame and so much guilt and all these stories around our, our own individual and collective sex and sexuality and our experiences and needs and desires and passions and wants. And, you know, that, that has, caused I know I'll speak for myself I've felt a lot of shame through the Mm -hmm. years about my own 
experiences and explorations and fantasies and desires that I've carried with me for most of my life until I finally started openly talking with other people about it and realized, oh, I'm not alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. And that shame and guilt is is very real. And it it has very real consequences in people's lives, psychological, physical, relationships wise. It's it's not it's not nothing. Oh, yeah. It's serious. And it can it it, it drives some people to suicide. It drives Mm -hmm. some people to just living a life where they're just not being their full selves. They're depressed. Mm -hmm. They're they're shut down, um, closed off. Or it's like the opposite. Like there's like you just some people dive so fully into it, but not necessarily from a conscious place. Right. You know, so par- part of why I'm doing this podcast is so that, you know, we can explore together. I'm, I am by no means an expert in, in, in any of this, except for my own experiences. And so, you know, I'm just so curious about all the different layers that, that <laughs> are involved, you know. So let me, I just want to properly introduce you to our audience so that the Ignite Intimacy crew and community knows the the power that we have <laughs> on the line today. And then I want to dive a little bit more into your own story and journey, because I'm so curious how you got to this area of study. Sure. Um, so, all right. So check it. Jana Vrangalova is a PhD. She's a New York City based sex researcher who studies casual sex, non-monogamy and sexual orientation. She mm. holds a PhD in developmental psychology from Cornell University and currently teaches human sexuality related courses as an adjunct professor at New York University. Holla! Big up my New York people and my, <laughs> and my Ithaca people. Um, her scholarly work has been published in a number of academic journals and she is also passionate about bringing accurate scientific information to the general audience. In working to dismantle sexual science to broader audiences, she also writes about sexuality for popular media like Playboy, Alternate, New York Daily News, Teen Vogue, Psychology Today. She shares new sex research on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And she runs a very hot website called The Casual Sex Project. And if you're just looking for a little turn on, just go over there and you'll get it. Trust me. Um, This Casual Sex Project is a place for people to share their true hookup stories. And they can do that anonymously which is pretty cool and does a weekly sex education show using the live video streaming platforms, Periscope and Facebook live. Jana is currently working on a book about the science of healthy hookups, which we will definitely be talking more about. And you're also doing some courses, right? There's a mansion somewhere in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Mansion somewhere. (laughs) I wouldn't quite call it a mansion, but uh, it's a, it's a nice big brownstone house in Brooklyn called the Hacienda Villa, which, which is basically the sex positive intentional community where about 14 people live in, in sort of their own rooms. But there's a, an event space in the basement and we teach, yes, we, we teach various sex sort of education classes there. Uh, myself, uh, my business partner, Kenneth Play, who's a sex educator and other people teach other things. But yeah, mm-hmm. so there's that. Awesome. Awesome. I and love that's that. open to pretty much anybody. You don't have to be an NYU student or any other <laughs> student. Cool. So yeah, people can find me pretty much anywhere as Dr. Jana, D-R-Z-H-A-N-A. Uh, and that's also my website, drjana.com. Great. Okay, cool. So Dr. D-R, Jana, mm-hmm. Z as in zebra, H-A-N-A. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Wow, Jana, this is really cool. Like, what led you into this whole area of study? Well, <clears throat> sexuality has always been a big part of my own life. And, you know, as a, as a highly sexual person, I would get myself into all sorts of trouble and uh, with with society and society's expectations about what uh, people were supposed to be like in terms of sexuality and relationships, what women in particular were supposed to be like. And I didn't like it. And uh, <laughs> I had my own ideas about how I was going to live my life. So it, it was just a big part of my own life. And when it came time to decide what it was that I was going to you know, dedicate my life studying, because I always knew I wanted to do a PhD. My, my father was a professor at a university. And so I kind of had an Mm. uh, an, in on that life and what that life was like. So I knew I wanted that. But while he was in electrical engineering, you know, my passions were more in something else. So I I kind of 
knew that the only thing that was probably going to keep my interest for the rest of my life was sexuality. And it also provides um, a good outlet for my kind of rebellious self because I like to exist outside the, the the lines a little bit and push push those those lines and and uh, I like things that are on the margins. So that's how I ended up not just studying sexuality but also certain aspects of sexuality that are not as uh, acceptable and that kind of push the push the limits of of social acceptability. Things like casual sex, non monogamy, non heterosexuality, and and so, so on. Mm, I love that. I love that. Well, because these are things that have existed like since the beginning of time, but there are masses of people who don't talk about them, don't even know they exist. It's like there are these communities that are thriving, non-monogamous communities, you know, just like open communities, sex clubs and sex parties. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like the list goes on. And if you're not hip to it or you don't know someone who's directly involved in, in it, then you are largely hidden from, you know, there's just not that much out there in the world Mm -hmm. about this stuff. So I love that you're, you're, you're doing like, you're doing the stuff that I don't always have the patience to do the research. Right. (laughs) So like, I love that you tie together, like the real deal research on it and the sort of more like live dynamic experience of it all. Yeah. So, I mean, initially, I actually thought that I would only be an academic because I was so passionate about doing research, which I know a lot of people are not <laughs> find it extremely boring and tedious and <laughs> all that. So, but I always loved it. I love statistics, you know, unlike most, you know, normal people. And, uh, <laughs> and so I knew I was going to do research, but I, I didn't actually quite realize how passionate I would be about sharing that research to the general audiences. I kind of thought uh, for the longest time that I would be one of those uh, ivory tower academics uh, who just did research and, you know, went and presented their research at uh, official kind of sex research conferences and then published in academic journals. And that would be about it. But then uh, towards the end of my PhD, probably the last year before I got my, defended my dissertation, one of my studies was picked up by the media and there was an entire month where you know all the media all around the world kind of wrote about that about that study and I would get all these interviews and and whatnot and it was the first time that I really became aware because I'm not not much of a pop culture kind of person I don't really consume a lot of pop culture and so I really became that that was a, a wake-up call that there is so much interest out there in the world for sexuality related information and there are so many inaccuracies and myths and stereotypes and um, also misrepresentations of the research so journalists often write about sex research but because they're not trained psychologists they're not trained researchers they Mm. often butcher that science pretty badly and so you know that research that gets shared with the general public is very often not exactly accurate not interpreted in the right way and that's where my I guess that's when I really realized that uh, my, my passion also lies in in this dissemination of accurate sex scientific information to people who are not going to read the journal articles that, you know, 20 people read anyway. So Mm, I love that. Well, thank you. Thank you from me (laughs) to you. (laughs) You're very welcome. And it's fun. It's fun. You know, it's a very different way of talking to people and writing and and teaching than than you would do in an academic setting. And so it's it's a real challenge for me to transition into that world. But also it's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do science, you often don't see the fruits of your labor until much later. Mm -hmm. You know, you started the study today and then probably you'll see it published maybe three, four, five years later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) You have to have have a lot of patience. Yes, you have to have a lot of patience. (laughs) It's a very long, long process. Whereas when you, you know, you, you write for popular media or you teach these, these more uh, kind of sex education classes, it's, it's very immediate. Mm-hmm. People, you know, you, you write a piece in, in one day or you teach a workshop and then it mm. affects people's lives in a very, very uh, immediate way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And you're tying the two together, which is just so cool. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So you, I, I want to like, let's get into the juicy stuff because you you have this real focus on casual sex, right? So t- t- tell me about that. Tell me about like what kind of 
led you to that specific focus? Well, when I started my PhD, so that was the, the topic of my dissertation, sort of is casual sex bad for, for you, bad for your mental health in particular. And when I was starting my, my whole PhD, there was very little research on it that it, in the psychological literature. And it seemed like there was, it was everywhere, you know, it was, I, was, I was surrounded, you know, especially when you're on a college campus, there's so much of it going on. And it, it was also something that was part of my own life. And I was really curious about this. And all of the research that was out was very simplistic. Mm-hmm. It was very, um, often came from a very kind of sex negative perspective, mm. where it just assumed from the get go that it was something that was bad, and we should prevent you know, people from doing or, or, you know, we should develop strategies and, and uh, different, you know, uh, ways to get people not to have it because it was bad. And, and my question was like, well, why is it bad? Do we know that it's bad? Mm. You know, okay. I could maybe see how it could lead to increased STIs if you're not being, you know, careful or practicing safer sex or something like that. But why should it be bad for mental health? And so that was a that was a question that was really driving my my research. So instead of just kind of looking at it in a very simplistic way, you know, taking a group of people who've had casual sex versus taking a group of people who haven't and then comparing their mental health, I wanted to see what are the factors behind that? What are the factors that might uh, that the relationship between casual sex and mental health might depend on? Because my thinking, you know, I could see people around me who were having it in a way that was very seemingly healthy for them and they were enjoying it and having a lot of fun with it. And then I was seeing people who really didn't seem like they were doing it in a healthy way and seemed to be suffering kind of um, as a consequence. So I knew that there were different types of people, there were different types of hookups. And so mm. if, if hooking up was here to stay, which it seems like it is, you know, <laughs> It's like drugs. You can't just say no. Yeah, yeah. Because it's there. It's uh, it's available. People are going to be doing it. And so my kind of goal over time became to figure out who are the people for whom it's a good thing, and then uh, and and who are the people for whom it might not be you know a good thing, and then um, how to do it right. What are some of the qualities of hookup experiences that make it a better experience for everybody involved versus some of the characteristics uh, that, you know, you might want to avoid while hooking up. Mm. All right. So yeah, let's talk about it because just from my own experiences, it's like, I seriously, as a grown ass woman, I'm still navigating the space and I've got to admit all of a sudden (laughs) it's getting better. But that whole experience when you consciously open to someone and then there's like, no follow up whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And and that piece of it is something I'd really love to pick your brain about because I'm I'm wondering what you've discovered in like the day after experience or like mm-hmm. how you might recommend powerfully setting up a scenario so that the day after scenario is different and new and doesn't feel like heavy or yucky or sad or disconnected or where you're second guessing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the golden key? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do have some some ideas. I mean, of course, it depends on what the situation is and what people's expectations are, right? So if, if, if one person is kind of expecting that this is now going to lead to something more and the other person was just thinking, oh, it's a one night stand, then, you know, things might be, you're, you're coming from a different perspective, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, whereas if both people are kind of aware of or, or, or thinking the same thing, or it's it's easier to to make that work. But yeah, the, the the after both the moments after the sex and then the day after uh, or the, the hookup, whatever kind of sexual activity happened, are pretty important. And I think a lot of people don't don't do that that, that aftercare, if you want to call it that, um, well. And I think part of the reason is. Again, no one really teaches us how to do casual sex well. Mm. And there's a lot of shame and guilt associated with the hooking up on both sides, especially if we we talk about heterosexual hookups. Right. Uh, You know, women often feel like they've done something that they shouldn't have done, Mm -hmm. you know, that that goes against uh, the, 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 the moral norms and their own norms, perhaps that, you know, they should only have sex with long term partners or, or people who might become potential long term partners that sex for the sake of sex is not is not a good enough reason to have it. 
And so uh, women often have those kinds of feelings. And then men can often have the feelings of guilt that they may have led someone to do something that they didn't want, even if, if they themselves feel feel good about uh, the fact that, you know, that because that's kind of within the the, the, the moral codes for, for uh, men. But they also often, again, have some guilt around uh, their partner. They often have fear around the woman sort of getting attached to quickly or too much or more mm. than they would like to because that's kind of another another stereotype around what happens after casual sex. So so people often just kind of after the sex is done, after that arousal has been has been taken care of, right? That has driven a lot of the behavior prior to that. And the behavior prior to that, prior to the orgasm or the end, may have been very, very different, right? Because people are aroused, people have a goal, people mm-hmm. are, are excited about, you know, doing something. And then once that has been done and that arousal is gone, that's that's when those feelings of guilt and shame and awkwardness can set in. And very often what we do today, because we have the luxury of doing that today, is just disappearing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay. what, so what, <clears throat> that's, that's such a curious piece to me is like, when you're in the heat of it, there's all of that, like, yes, 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 you know, like, mm-hmm. and, and then as soon as the goal, whatever that goal is, or was, has been met, all of a sudden, you can literally, you're like, boom, uh, like, you can just shut off, turn off, go the other way. And what is that about psychologically and physically? Yeah, I mean, some people have that ability, I guess, more than others. And I I really think a lot of that comes from these feelings of guilt, shame and and, or fear Mm. around what this means, what's going to happen. And so it's it's a defense mechanism that people feel like they need to employ in order to protect themselves from any of these things. And because we live in a culture where, right, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to see that person the next day, depending on how you met and right, what the circumstances are, but you kind of have that luxury of disappearing. It's often the easiest reaction for people to, the easiest thing for people to do mm. because they don't want to, they, they don't want to be faced with, you know, the challenges of whatever those fears and feelings of, of of awkwardness or shame or guilt may be. And also because we often just don't have the language, Mm -hmm. don't have the training for how to handle these situations better. Mm. Because, you know, let's say that, um, let's say that all you wanted is, is a one night stand. There are ways that you can communicate that while still making the other person feel good about what they've done. Mm. Right. Um, So, so certainly the, the, the post-sex interaction can be, uh, approached with kindness and care and just basic human affection and care about the person that you just had sex with. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next day, you know, it doesn't take much to send a nice little text saying, you know, that was fun. And if you want to see that person again, you know, maybe we'll do it again. If you don't want to see that person again, you know, you, you don't have to, you, you don't have to disappear. And even if, if they ask you, you know, we should do it again instead of disappearing, you know, the nice thing to do would be to say, I think this was a one night thing for me, Mm. or I think I'm interested in a repeat or whatever. Right. Mm, I love that. So I think, and I think that's treating people with, with care and respect. We don't have to want to marry them and have babies with them Mm -hmm. in order to be respectful. And so, but I think a lot of that lack of respect that comes or, or lack of, lack of care that comes, um, after casual encounters comes from this, notion that we have around casual sex, that it's something bad, that it's something dirty, that the people mm. who do it are somehow, you know, lesser human beings than, than the people who won't do it. And so that we don't have to treat them with as, with as much care. And that's all something that we can change, right? Mm-hmm. It's all about how we perceive this relational context. I love that. There is research, you know, that is just coming out now, uh, looking at the qualities of uh, hookups that when hookups have more passion, more intimacy, more connection during the encounter, they're rated better by everybody involved. Mm, I love so, that. Because, you know, even a one night stand, you know, it can range on the amount of passion or intimacy that happens during that one hour or two hours or however you know much time you spend. It can range from being very detached you know, very kind of mechanical, very, uh, you know, we're going to join our genitals quickly together and then bye-bye to being very into each other, right? Like wanting to 
ravish one another and tear each other's clothes off and whatnot. And the more of that you have, the more pleasurable that experience was for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. A, A new research that just got presented at a research conference that I was at last month. So it's it's not out yet, but it will be out uh, very recently. Was looking at this, I think it was a, a big study of um, college students where they asked them, you know, when, when you're hooking up with someone, how interested are you in the sex versus how interested are you in cuddling? Mm. And, Interesting. Yeah. And they asked that about, you know, when you're hooking up with someone and also when you're having sex with a long term romantic partner. Right. So this the same questions. And they expected that, you know, people would say that they were highly interested in both cuddling and sex with a romantic partner. But for a hookup that most people would say, you know, I'm just interested in sex, not really interested in cuddling. And but the reality was about 50 or 60 percent of both men and women said that they were also interested in cuddling, even in the context of a hookup. Wow. Yeah. I love that. That gives me (laughs) so much hope and faith for the future. (laughs) Because, like, I love cuddling, you know? And cuddling is so beautiful. And we all, I believe that we all need more cuddling. Absolutely. And, And, like, as a society, especially, you know, from in my family, there wasn't a lot of physical touch when we Mm -hmm. were kids. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of hugging and, you know, like physical, like, Oh, let's cuddle on the couch and that kind of thing. And, and I don't know if that's why I've just had this like voracious appetite for cuddling as, uh, (laughs) you know, in my life. But, uh, so, you know, I've just like, Oh God, I've just had this need for that type of connection. Mm -hmm. And I, and I realized that when I was a teen and the behavior that I would describe it now I think it's different, but back then I would say like I was very promiscuous teenager and I was seeking love and attention and validation and acknowledgement from men and boys and mm-hmm. you know, so but really I wanted to be loved and seen. Mm-hmm. That's what I really wanted, you know, and and just appreciated for who I am and and I thought that, you know, God, if I could give a really good blowjob, I'm going to get that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, right. like, and But it was so twisted and it was so coming from this really tender, sad place within myself that as a youth, I didn't feel like I got the love and physical attention that I needed from my mom and my dad. Mm-hmm. And some of the great things about that is that I see that now. And I'm a grown woman and I have a very, I'm developing a very new relationship to all of that. And I also know how to give, you know, a pretty fucking, <laughs> <Good blowjob. laughs> yeah. so, you know, it all served its win-win. Win-win. Yeah, it's a win-win, but Eventually. you know, look, they say adversity, right? It's a spice of life. So, um, so yeah. Um, so that's a very good point about, uh, that physical connection and touch. Uh, the U S in particular is a very touch less society I find. And, you know, mm-hmm. I come from a different mm-hmm. culture where people hug and kiss a lot. Oh yeah. More, oh yeah. You know, even in you know, completely non-sexual <laughs> context. Right. So, and human beings, you know, we're, we're a social species. We need connection. We need other humans, both on a psychological level and on a physical level. And there's so much research showing that that physical touch in, in that in that that kind, right? Hugging and, and uh, holding and petting and you know being physically close to people in an intimate way is really good for our health, is really important. People who get touched more often, they're healthier and, and happier. Mm-hmm. And uh, in in the US, you know, a lot of the time families don't provide a lot of that touch. It's not really encouraged. In fact, it's very looked down uh, upon and, and kind of frowned upon to have that with friends or, you know, other non-familial adults like teachers doing that to students. Is You know, we're very, very oh, yeah. uh, paranoid that everything oh, yeah. is sexual assault. And yes, yeah, it's, we've it's, taken a that. Dis, it's a dis-ease in this society. Yeah. yeah, we've taken that to a whole nother extreme. You know, it's, it's one thing to want to protect vulnerable people and children from being abused, but it's another thing to completely, you know, uh, create this, the society devoid of, of touch and and intimacy, non-sexual intimacy with, uh, with people that can 
var various characters that can provide that in, in their lives, whether it's teachers or, you know, friends or whatever. But um, so, yeah, I think we, we do see that a lot. And um, touch and intimacy is something that we all need. We all crave some some more than others, for sure, depending on our personality, depending on our upbringing and, and all that. But the sexual encounter and this is, you know, I want to connect that to hooking up. The sexual encounter has that has an intimacy component as well as a sexual component. And and both of those needs are thing needs that can be met with with uh, with a sexual encounter, and that's why it's it, it, it's so important to have both. But people have this very dichotomous, very binary view of you know casual sex is just sex, and there's no intimacy. Period. Mm -hmm. and, and intimacy is something that you get only from from long term partners, and we're we're shortchanging the casual experience because as human beings, we're all capable of of, of creating and, and experiencing casual intimacy. Mm, I love that. I mean, you're sitting next to someone on a, on an airplane. If there's a turbulence, you know, you can have this like instant kind of connection and, and, and sense of intimacy. You can grab each other's hands and hold, you know, hold each other in a way, right? Mm. You can create these, mm. these moments of casual intimacy with complete strangers. Why could you do that with someone that you're having sex with, right? That's a very, yeah, like the most, I mean, yeah. the, the most, it's like one of the most vulnerable ways you could be mm -hmm. with another human being and mm -hmm. and somehow that the intimacy piece has been like almost demonized like mm -hmm. stay away from that you know that that okay. might make you close you know and right. <laughs> And it's really sad. I think we're, we're basically taking away from the experience when we do that, both our own experience That's and right. the other person's experience. Yeah. Now, to be fair, there are, you know, there, there are pitfalls around that. So, you know, when you're having sex with somebody, because as, as you said, it is one of the most intimate things that you can do with, with another human being, it does potentially bring you closer. It can create the sense of infatuation and, and, and emotional attachment. And the more you have sex with somebody and the more, the, the better that is, and the more of these intimate type behaviors that are included in that experience, the more of that bond is, is created and, and strengthened. And so for some people, you know, if they know ahead of time that, you know, this is not something that has the potential for whatever reason to continue, you know, they might need to protect themselves from that intimacy, that this kind of involuntary attachment taking place, because mm. sometimes it's out of our conscious control whether that's going to happen or not. It's your your brain is on drugs, right? And neurochemicals totally. that are being released in, in those moments, you know, oxytocin and then dopamine and all these things that make you really excited and then also kind of make you bond to the person that, you know, you, you're experiencing these intimate behaviors with. So, you know... It, in 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 some cases, it might be good to, to it's good to know yourself and what have realistic expectations about what something can and can cannot be, and then kind of use the strategies that you need to use to stay unattached if you want to stay unattached, or you know maybe maybe uh, to some extent control the amount of attachment that the other person can have towards you, like how often you see people and how you know whether you see other people in between, like things like having a rotation of partners mm -hmm. as opposed to seeing mm -hmm. the same person, you know three four times a week can can kind of keep that infatuation at bay to some extent or certainly spending the night having breakfast in the morning that is more intimacy inducing that than not doing that but i think there's a so so, so you know th there's no right way to go about these things but i think it, it people often take either one or the other extreme and often you know, use these these intimacy blocking kind of strategies too too much, too often, even when they don't know what the whether the other person needs that or not, mm. right? So and, they're kind of well, and and they haven't even had a conversation, right, right? right? So like before any clothes even come off, like have a conversation, just as two adults who are mm -hmm. you're about to engage in a transaction. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's not a business transaction, but it could be looked at as that. I mean, it's, it's a transaction. And, and so I know for myself as bold and outspoken as I can be at times, I can get really 
shy and fumble. And I am a speaker. Like I can off the top of my, I could get up on a stage and talk for an hour just off the top of Mm -hmm. my head, you know, but when I'm sitting there with someone that I'm like into and attracted to, and there's all that energy there, sometimes I could just feel like a complete fool and idiot as I'm trying to like fumble out (laughs) <laughs> what I want and what I need. And like, what I'm starting to get really good at is not for me, I've realized it is unless I am like in a scenario where I'm traveling, I'm never going to see this person again. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, getting fucked in Spain or whatever. Right. It's right. Like, you know, like, I realize I am not that into one night, like one offs. And, mm-hmm. and I'm, I did a six month man pause last year mm-hmm. around, I started it around this time last year. And, and I just realized like, I really love follow up the next day, mm-hmm. you know, and like, and not, I don't, I just, I don't, I'm not trying to like control anybody or control the situation, but I know that I really enjoy hearing from someone after we've spent time together. And mm-hmm. so just knowing that for myself, it's helping me to be more powerful about saying like, Actually, you know, I, I'm not totally open to just fucking the first night that we hang out. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I actually, I like to build the energy and Mm -hmm. even if it is more of a casual thing that we're not going to be boyfriend and girlfriend, I still enjoy building the energy because for me, it makes it more meaningful, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that communication piece is just so important. And it's like, I feel like let us all just choose to communicate more and and more better and clearer and more courageously in our intimate and sexual experiences. Amen <laughs> to that, for sure. I mean, it, it's funny, we kind of went from, from the ending <laughs> to, to the beginning instead of the other way around, right? From mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the after, the day after to what happens before. But that's absolutely, so it really starts with knowing yourself and knowing yeah. what you need in order to have a positive, good, healthy, fulfilling experience. For you, that might mean, well, getting to know the person a little bit and building it up a bit. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with having that need, even if you are not planning on, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, you know, kids in marriage scenario, right? There are a lot of different types of casual sex. You know, the one night stand with a complete stranger is at the, you know, most casual of the casual <laughs> continuum, right? But b- between that and, you know, the, 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 the marriage altar, there's so many, so many kind of, you know, shades of, of <laughs> shades of gray. Whatever, pink. <laughs> yeah. I like pink better. <laughs> uh, right. You know, you have your, your fuck buddies, you have your friends with benefits, you have people that, you know, you have maybe these short flings that, you know, are not going to go anywhere, but it's just fun to do for a little bit. You know, you, you, you can have a one night stand with someone that you've actually known more for more than you know the 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 typical scenario you you go to a bar you pick up someone you you fuck them and then you never see them again but you know you could build it up for three four or five times then have a one night thing and then be like "Uh, you know all right peace i don't need to do that again you know (laughs) it may have been good it may have been mediocre whatever but for whatever reason i'm 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 good right so it's different people have different needs for some people that completely casual experience is very satisfying, Mm -hmm. right? Just whatever, uh, the the experience of the novelty or, you know, the story of how quickly it happened and how like, you know, they, they get off on, uh, and the sex itself and whatever, but other people need more. And so it's really important to know what you need and then create those kinds of situations and being honest with your partners, letting them know what it is that, that you need is critical because, they're not mind readers. That's right. That's no. right. And it's okay. <laughs> and they don't have to be. Yeah. And I used to no. get so caught up on that. Like, can't he tell like in my mind, you know, and it was like, no, he can't no. tell. <laughs> no, he has his own needs, his own desires, his own hopes and expectations and limitations. Yeah. And when things aren't communicated, this is something that people very often forget. What happens as human beings when we don't have very clear information about what some somebody else wants, we project our own mm. wants onto them. So if things are vague, they're ambiguous, you know, people are giving you ambiguous cues uh, or they're like, well, whatever you want, then people, that's what we all do in sexual and non-sexual situations. We say, oh, well, 
she must want the exact same thing that I want. And Mm. so I'm going to proceed as if that is the case, unless I'm told otherwise, right? We're not very good at putting ourselves in other people's shoes unless they tell us. And some Mm. people are better at that than others. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are very good at reading more subtle signs nonverbal signs and, and, but uh, many of us are not very good. And especially if you add alcohol to it, Mm -hmm. which is often part of the casual sex experience, then people are even worse at being able to read subtle signs. So it's really important to let people know what it is that you want. And we all have flexibility around, you know, what could be good for us. Right. So maybe your ideal scenario is, you know, build it up over the course of, you know, two, three dates. But sometimes, you, you know, you could have a lot of fun on the first date. And the same, same thing with, you know, with somebody whose preference might be to just have sex right away. But, you know, they have flexibility if, if you tell them, you know, let's, let's leave this for next time. So, yeah, communication mm. is just so important. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And, and, um, and also, we just have different connections with different people as well. So, like, Absolutely. sometimes you just have a serious dialed intuitive connection with someone and like there's not a lot of communi- like verbal communication that needs to take place like mm-hmm. some lovers are better for us than others you know mm-hmm. and but but talking about it and also gosh I just I'm so grateful I have had a stream of men come into my world recently that communicate that talk that ask me they're curious what do you like what do you want and it's mm-hmm. and it's also helped me be more bold and brave with men and asking Mm -hmm. them like what do you want what do you like what you know like and what are you thinking about and like what do you think about when you think of me and and you know and like stoking that fire Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that can be so much fun Mm -hmm. yeah I mean we you know we, we paint these these very caricaturistic type images of what men are like and women are like right men are all they want is to get laid and you know fuck Mm, as many people mm. as possible with as with as little emotion as possible and all women want is to be in love and whatnot and that's that's crazy i mean Mm. that's just that's just bs science science (laughs) over and over again shows that yes on average there are these gender differences on average as a whole when you compare all men and all women yes men are somewhat more interested in sexuality and casual sex and women are somewhat less interested in that but you know it, there, there's so much variability within gender and there's so many people who who you know so many women who do want the sexual component and so many men who want the intimacy and yeah. and especially for the intimacy part it's interesting you know people often see those two things as the end point of like a single continuum, right? If you want sex, then the more sex, casual sex you want, the less intimacy in relationships you want, right? Mm -hmm. And the more intimacy in relationships you want, the less casual sex you want. But research shows that that's not actually true, Mm. that people vary tremendously on, on how much they want casual sex. So some people want a lot of casual sex, or, or, you know, they can have it and they're, they're seeking it out um, on, a, on a fairly regular basis. Some people have absolutely zero interest in it and, you know, have no, no desire to have it. And then many people are somewhere in between. So it's kind of like a, a, a bell curve, a normally distributed personality trait, like extroversion, introversion, right? Mm. Some people are super extroverted. Some people are super introverted. Many people are somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. But with intimacy and, and romance, that's not the case. It's a very skewed distribution. The vast majority of people do want intimacy and romance and connection. Mm, mm. And there are very few people out there who, who really don't want that. And that's, get, that goes back to what is, and if you think about it, what is a f- evolutionarily adaptive? Connection, intimacy, you know, long-term bonding, all of those things, they're critical to human survival. Mm-hmm. Casual sex is not. It yeah. can help. <laughs> it can certainly help, right? It can it can have some evolutionary benefits, you know, greater diversity of your genetic offspring, you know, it can it can help maybe forge forge other connections or whatever. So there are certainly benefits to it, but it's not as critical to our survival. We can all survive as a human species, and we always could, even if if people only had long term relationships. Mm-hmm. So this was kind of an added bonus that some people developed the knack for, and other people did not. Totally. Um, or was something that, well, is a luxury in certain circumstances or certain people had sort of the, the luxury to add 
some casual sex to their to their repertoire of sexual and, and relationship experiences. But intimacy is not a luxury. Intimacy and, and connection and long term kind of connection is is kind of a basic need. Mm. And so most of us have it. And when we tell men that they shouldn't want it because they're men, because all men want is sex, we are really taking away from from their mental health and well-being and emotional thriving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and okay, so I'm curious about your thoughts on this as we're just kind of starting to wrap up here. So sex means different things to different people. Mm hmm. And I have a lover friend that, you know, I've, I've really been very clear, like that I'm not interested in just jumping into sexual intercourse with this person right away. I'm like really not wanting that right away. Although we have experienced other things together. Mm -hmm. And so his whole thing was like, he was just totally blown away that like, I would consider that we haven't had sex yet just because we haven't had intercourse what <laughs> what are your thoughts on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's funny how people define sex d- depends on so many things you know we have certain cultural standards that you know penis and vagina sex is considered sex by pretty much anybody but then once you veer off from that particular act, there's a lot of variability in whether people think that is sex or not. And there's no correct answer there. Mm. There really isn't. Mm -hmm. For you, you know, having your nipples uh, nibbled on could be sex. And for somebody else, anal sex does not count as sex. Mm I mean, it's all sexual behavior, right? As as long as it's something that is causing, you know, sexual arousal and potentially could lead to orgasm or, I mean, there's no one, there's, there's no right way to, to, to define sex. And so I think it's perfectly acceptable for people to have different definitions of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like as, as big as the spectrum is from casual to committed, totally non-monogamous you know, right. long-term <laughs> partnership is the spectrum of, you know, what is sex, what, when, what isn't. Um, and, I, and I think it's actually really important to do, though, to define it when you're with a partner. Yes. Right? <laughs> Have that conversation of what exactly sex means to you. Yes. Yes. Uh, because that can, can be very consequential for things like, well, what is cheating? Well, that depends on, you know, what sex is defined, you know, how sex is defined or mm. what is, you know, what, what kind of behaviors are we going to engage in you and I, when I say let's have sex. Right. And so it's, yeah, it's something that even though we're all entitled to our own version of our own definition of, of sexuality it's, or sex, it's important to communicate that clearly with partners. Absolutely. Dr. Jana, you are the woman. I freaking love you. I <laughs> cannot wait to meet you in person. I want to do like, I'd love to do another conversation with you. I'm just so grateful to have you and your beautiful, powerful, brilliant energy on the line with us today for Ignite Intimacy. You are a gift in this world. You're just, I can just feel your spirit and your essence and just you're just a beautiful being. I'm just so grateful that you decided to, you know, choose this path because I can only imagine how many thousands and thousands and in the future, millions and millions of lives that you will touch positively oh. and, and help to just wake up and empower and just, you know, help people to just feel like they're not alone and to help people to make better, more conscious choices and to communicate better and to have better sex and to, you know, just continue exploring (laughs) all of this. So I just, I thank you on behalf of like the collective. (laughs) That's the dream. Yes. Hopefully I will be able to do that. (laughs) Oh yeah. Well, you're on your way. And um, so tell us again, where can we find you online? Yeah. So my website is Dr. Jana, D-R-Z-H-A-N-A.com. And uh, a lot of the information uh, about what I do and the events and, you know, where people can see me in real life uh, are on there. I'm also the same handle. Dr. Jana is on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and Periscope. And the Casual Sex Project, uh, casualsexproject.com is uh, where they can, you know, people can share their own stories of hookups or or perv on other people's stories of hookups. (laughs) 
but yeah, I'm New York City based. So if people want to see me in person, they they can often come to my workshops here. But I am uh, finishing up a book about healthy hookups, right? A lot of the stuff that we talked about on um, on the podcast today is in- included in that book and, and, you know, in much, in much more detail and uh, supported by science and, and all of that. So hopefully that will be coming out some point soon. Cool. 2017, maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed. Maybe, hopefully, yeah. yes. Cool. Well, so, and do you have a newsletter where people can sign up on your website? Yes, yes, there's cool. a newsletter. So if they go on my website, they'll, uh, they'll probably get a pop-up or they can go to a bit.ly link. So bit dot uh, ly slash legit sex sci awesome awesome okay dr jana d-r-z-h-a-n-a dot com check her out i'm just again so so grateful for your time and your brilliance and just everything that you shared with us today have a beautiful amazing holiday new year enjoy your time traveling and just you know um taking some time to focus and surf and enjoy life and i cannot wait <laughs> to you. to connect with you again thank you yes. so much see you in uh, in person next time hopefully yes uh, totally Thank you. <laughs> All okay. right. Well, Ignite Intimacy community, you heard Dr. Jana and I just jamming out on basically casual sex communication, how to have more sexy, empowered experiences with each other as we're moving through life. And if you have any questions or you comments or topics that you'd like for us to to cover or questions for Dr. Jana, feel free to email us at hello at igniteintimacy.com. It's hello at igniteintimacy.com. Check us out on iTunes. I'd love some reviews. And yeah, I trust that this was as good and juicy as it was for me as it is for you. So or as it is for you as it is for me. (laughs) So have a beautiful, beautiful day and stay blessed. We'll see you on the next one. Give thanks for tuning in to another conversation on the Ignite Intimacy podcast hotline. We love that you choose to spend your time with us. Check us out online at igniteintimacy.com and subscribe to us on iTunes. Also, tell your friends all about it. This beautiful music was arranged by Jason Pfaff and Mike Corey. And this podcast is produced by yours truly, Miss La. Give thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one. In the meantime, let your light shine bright and ignite your intimacy.